Um, so the, with that three videos of understanding dimensional reality. So the first one deals with patterns in the heavens. Now, these, these teachings come in a context of the end of time. God is emphasizing things because it is the end of time. You know that revelations are released from season to season or from time to time according to the specific season that God has over us. So the first video speaks about patterns in the heavens, the nature and the dominance of light and darkness above and surrounding us. So we are surrounded by the nature of God, we're surrounded by the nature of the devil himself, and he, the enemy is trying to also uh, put pressure on us as much as God is trying to get us somewhere in himself. So that first video, it's teaching us about uh, the nature and the dominance of the kingdom of light and also the kingdom of darkness. And both of them, um, uh, the kingdom of light is meant for our benefit, uh, the kingdom of darkness for our destruction. So God is re-emphasizing understanding this part that we are surrounded by uh, these two forces or kingdoms, if I were to put it that way. Also in part one, we talk about the sovereignty of God, uh, which I, want, I will touch on today. We also talk about the fall of Adam and Eve, which I have uh, entitled Unmasking and the Origin of Self. Um, in that part, we also speak about the angels that are God's ministers released to assist us to fulfill the will of God. Um, so that's, that's what part one is all about. It's taking us to the heavens to understand uh, certain things we see in the earth are as a result of movement in the spirit that we are not aware of, and it's important to be aware of that. Uh, Ephesians chapter 2, it speaks of the devil, how he is still working in the children of disobedience till this day. So I read a book about spiritual warfare. It sort of shows... The different scriptures where it says the devil has no power or let me say authority in that case. Uh, but if you read scripture carefully, you realize he has certain abilities. He may not have authority, but the devil surely has certain abilities that can almost um, uh, place themselves as an authority and a power. When you read the Old Testament, you hear of the prince of, of Persia who blocked the prayer of Daniel for 21 days and Gabriel could not go through, meaning that demon had authority to arrest Gabriel until the Bible says Michael was sent. Only when Michael, the angel of war, was sent, Gabriel was able to come down. And the Bible says when Gabriel was talking to Daniel, he says, hey, I have to go back and still fight that prince of Persia. Um, so the devil has some abilities, and his demons have some abilities, and God is, is bringing us to take note of that very, very seriously in this season as we move towards the close of time. We're not dealing with weak devils. We're dealing with devils that has abilities and they've been operating for, for, for generations and generations, and especially even in our own families. So understanding patterns in the heavens is extremely important to know the spiritual powers that operate above us as, as individuals, that operate above us as families, and also that operates above us as, as KCA. Amen? So that is part one. And I'll try to talk to God's sovereignty and unmasking uh, self today. The second video speaks about the operations in the earth of the very same powers, tracking the patterns of darkness to understand the structure of our lives uh, that Satan is after. So we look at how Satan operates in the earth and uh, how he is really going for our lives 
Um, so that becomes very, very important to understand. Secondly, Jesus presents himself as a pattern on how to deal with satanic operations. So we look into Christ to understand how to deal with this enemy who's after, firstly, our just salvation. Um, secondly, our family progress and growth. Uh, thirdly, our church growth and moving forward. You should remember all of us were under an assignment. We understand that part, right? Yes. Uh, when time comes to a close, we are under an assignment. Everybody has to be prepared to give an account to God in terms of what you are called to do. You understand that part very well, right? I don't have to remind you that it's extremely, extremely important. You're not just in church, but you're under an assignment that God expects you and me to actually fulfill. So we also have, we, in, in, in the second part or second video, we look at satanic activities to destroy the community by, commu by, by corrupting the leader uh, or the head of a family in, 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 this, in this context. Certain, uh, certain activities to destroy KCA that he, he, lines, he lines up against me, my wife, and my children so that KCA will be destroyed. So there is that dimension. So the second video also speaks to that. The third video speaks about personal battle. Uh, this is what I call dimensional war or spiritual warfare. There are demonic powers uh, that are actually attracted and they are fortified by addictive indulgence of ungodly lifestyles. They are also demons of laziness. People just not achieving anything or doing anything. Just sitting there. Not being useful to God. Because they're not doing what they're meant to do. They don't take the positions to do the things they are meant to do. Amen. So there are demonic powers in every area that contradicts God. And the job of the enemy is to introduce people and us into these things so that they become too addictive to us. And in that way, we attract these devils into our lives uh, unaware. So we need to understand this personal battle that we have, that there are spirits after each one of us, after each one of us. And the more I go through these videos of UDR, I keep thinking about um, transformation imperative. That video we did on transformation imperative, it seeks to describe what's your foundation uh, that you define yourself by. You are black, you are a woman, you are from this family and this culture and these backgrounds and this and this. Those things are very, very important to be able to pay attention to. Because those are the things the devil uses uh, when he war, when he, he, he battles with us. He goes to, to those lengths um, to use uh, false definers of our lives. We are in the midst of titanic battles and our heavenly resources in this is the Holy Spirit and God's angelic host that are coded by or to the word of God. Angels are not under our command. We will never command even one. They're coded to the word of God. They only minister according to the release of God. Only God says, go, they go. Stay, they stay. No one human being can order an angel. They are not there for our order. They are under uh, the order of the word of God. So these are the three main parts. When we say UDR, we are talking about this. There's of, obviously, there's more to it. Uh, the more you play it, the more you discover new things and new things as we go along. But God is trying to bring us to this dimensional war so we can be able to position ourselves to do battle. Uh, it's obviously a season where each one of us should fight for, for ourselves and for the call of God in our lives. Nothing will just happen all by itself. We have to stand up and do battle. But to do battle, we need to have an understanding what are we dealing with and uh, what kind of structure are we ourselves because it will be out of that that we'll be able to know how to position ourselves for war. 
So UDR is really loaded. Uh, we need to pay attention carefully to what God is trying to teach us. We need not divert. I always say when God speaks away today, it's for our preparation to deal with tomorrow. We need to pay attention to these things because the tomorrow that is coming needs us to be well built in understanding dimensional reality. Amen. So we walk around with a much better understanding. Why must we understand dimensional reality? Because the purpose of God is coming to fulfillment. The Lord is becoming more manifest. Now, this is a main one for me. Why must we understand these dimensional realities? Because God had made declarations about the end of time. And when God makes declarations, it shapes the, the heavenly activities that should line up to what God had intended. They, it, it, they should actually come to pass. So that says to me a lot uh, in terms of that. So we are moving to the end of time and the space between dimensions is shrinking because of this factor. Factor number one, the purposes of God is coming to fulfillment. We need to position ourselves to know finally God's word will come to pass. So Malachi 3.1, it says, Behold, I send my messenger and he will prepare the way before me. And the Lord whom you seek will do what? Suddenly, suddenly come. There's a time for God to speak a word over us, over KCA. There's a time to fulfill it. When he still speaks it, it, it prepares our heart in a particular way. But when he says, now I'll watch over my way to perform it, it will suddenly come to pass. It shifts us also in a particular way. We start preparing ourselves to get ready to see the manifestation of all that God had said concerning us, amen, and concerning his work in our lives. We position ourselves uh, in that way. Certain things, certain activities need to be cut off when we prepare ourselves for God to appear in our lives. When it's a season for God to fulfill his word, we, we rearrange life. We literally rearrange uh, our priorities. We rearrange our personal structure. You know, Woodruff will always say, uh, when God speaks, we pivot. We have this internal pivot so that we can embrace what God just said. So in other words, my heart, my thinking uh, must be rearranged based on the arriving word. No one receives a word with the same heart of yesterday. Every time the word comes, everybody should shift. Are you hearing me, children of God? We can't be the same person when God speaks. Something must happen inside us. It must change. There must be a transformation time after time after time after time. Because every time God speaks is to build us. Amen? Is to transform us to be more like Christ. So there has to be rearrangement of things in our internal structure when God speaks. What, what separates people who really walk with God and ordinary Christians, it's exactly that point. When God speaks, people don't shift inside. They sit around the word of God for too long. They sometimes don't get used to it. It's, well, that's what we do. Every Sunday we come here. Hence, it's very easy to be bored. To say, let's try another church. Because you're not looking for transformation. You're looking for excitement something that fits how you feel and what you want to hear. And I find it very powerful to can accept that when God speaks, it will never measure up to what we think should be. Otherwise, he's not God. Amen? <coughs> Otherwise, He is just us. If he speaks what we want, we have just figured God and probably we have just become God. But... UDR is telling us God is arriving in a different way and he wants to fulfill what he promised. Then everybody must prepare to walk in that because God is, is arriving. And I want to make sure that we understand very well. Don't let your season pass you by because you didn't realize the day of your visitation when God says, this is the season I'm going to fulfill. He said the Lord of the latter house shall be greater, but then we need to make room and space for him to can glorify our lives in the house of God.
We have to shift things. You with me? So in this house, we need to master that. We need to master the speaking of God always produce a better me. Amen. So the Lord is about to come to pass. In this house, he has prophesied a lot of things. They are about to happen. I'm positioning my heart for that. Things are about to happen. Amen. I'm getting myself ready because I've been in a journey with God. We have been in a journey with God. Amen. So if God is opening us up to another season, we better be ready uh, to enter there with him. And our mindset is very important towards that. Not only our mindset, but like I said, making room for God to move in a new way. God said to DNW, uh, when God was opening a new season over the Congress, don't come too close. Give me room. Because you've never been this way before. In other words, don't try to figure out what to do. Let me describe what needs to be done. Yes, I've spoken step one. You take step one and wait. Don't try to figure out if step one is this, then means step one is two. And then we miss God in that sense. So it's time to really wait for proper instructions from God. Number two, the enemy is intensifying his interventions in the lives of the people. We know that is true, right? The enemy has intensified himself such that even children are caught up in devilish things too early than we were caught up in. You know, the social media out there has opened up uh, channels for the enemy to just trap children who should not be trapped into those things. So the enemy has really intensified himself at every level. At every level. KCA leadership level is right in the midst of it. Because it's intensifying that this work will not be coordinated, will not be managed properly, will not be facilitated the way it should be. It brings all kinds of excuses. He's just intensifying himself. So people find excuses not to work for God. And my challenge is, if we call ourselves Christians, we are called to work. So when he comes, what will he find? A person who's seated down? And what reason are we going to give? What reason are we going to give? So as much as God is about to fulfill his word, the enemy on the other hand is about to, I mean, is ready to make sure we do not get that fulfillment of the word. So we need to be sharp and be awake. There is an enemy after each one of us and uh, after family and after KCA. And then thirdly, the church is more able. Um, if we understand UDR, we will understand that shrinking between dimensions it's that it brings the church to a place where it can interface directly with the purposes of God that's a big one too ability to interface directly with the purposes of God coming into the earth through maturity and I want to talk a little bit about that because God's intention is that he positions us to interface with him very directly Spirit awake, our spirits are awake, we can hear, uh, we can see clearly, we can act, we can hear the word of God real time. You know, where God says, don't go in here, there. you know, real time, because he's bringing things to a close. So these things are, are extremely important. Now, according to me, uh, maturity is heavily attacked by the enemy in the body of Christ. Because it is the standard and platform upon which uh, the return of the Lord is triggered. Ephesians speaks to that. Before Christ comes, it speaks about we all come to the full measure of the stature of Christ. Now that triggers the judgment of the devil in the earth. So the only thing the devil can do is don't get the church to mature. Hopefully I can delay Every time you talk about maturity, people think you're talking about uh, error free. No mistake. That's what people think. But that's not what it is. Uh, so there's some serious attack over maturity. Even in this house, every time I talk about maturity, people uh, sometimes uh, they are used by enemy to talk negative about it. Um, 
If God says you can be perfect, you can. Amen? And it's him who defines what perfection is. It doesn't mean error-free at all. It's not, as long as we are in this body, we will still make mistakes. But maturity and perfection speaks a different thing. But however, what I want us to be aware of is that when you strive for maturity, the enemy will attack you greatly. Because to be mature, it's a very powerful tool in itself. Uh, Maturity is a platform upon which direct divine interfacing with God is activated. And there are scriptures that speak to that. Scripture that says strong meat doesn't belong to the babies. There's some things in God that can only be activated when we mature. If we don't, they don't get activated. They are prayers of the mature. They are prayers of the immature. And the two don't necessarily receive the same level of authority flowing from God. So maturity is really, really attacked in the church. Such that we sit here for five years, we can't really tell what they have been busy doing. What was I working on? Where am I? What did really God say for the past five years? Things that were very direct to me in those things. So the enemy will just bring us all kinds of other things, but moving into a platform we call maturity. Because he knows if we don't get there, we'll be limited in the way we interface with God. And that's the way things are. So maturity must not be a swear word. It must be a word we run towards. We must gravitate towards the word maturity. We must desire it. We must pray for it. If we can pray for these other things, why don't we pray for maturity? You know, um, because it's a very powerful platform if we can achieve it. And the enemy knows that. And as he fights the church never to be mature. It's a platform upon which we can stand in full presentation authority, able to go on the offensive to fulfill God's purposes. In other words, maturity is a place upon which you have strength to know what God said and force the fulfillment of that word. By, being enf- by, by enforcing it upon the devil himself. Uh, God spoke, and you move into action to bring that way to pass. By books, the Bible says Daniel understood the time of Israel to move out. He then moved into prayer in line with that word. And he carried so much authority because of his relationship with God. So the enemy is fighting maturity because he knows authority of prayer and of living is linked to maturity. Like I said, spiritual babies, they eat milk and talk milk language. Mature Christians, the says they get strong meat. They interact with God at a very higher level. So what's the job of the devil? Keep the people in church. Let them look for nice things, but no development, no growth. In some other countries, the enemy also shifted the focus from maturity to, uh, what can I call it, a more an emotionally based or build ministry or service. People were looking for something that touches me, something that touches my emotions. And such that even the preaching of the word was all about that hype. Something that excites you. Something that uh, builds your faith, confidence. But basically it was just exciting you. Not necessarily building faith. Amen. And I think it took years for the church to realize, no man, we are missing it here. Because the enemy is crafty, the Bible says. He makes us do nice church things. So we forget maturity. He causes us to do or to have a beautiful, nice church. Our focus is not on empowering people to can stand in authority before God by a platform we call a mature Christian. Amen? Isn't the Bible that says, if you have an issue with your brother, don't even pray because it's not going to work. Go fix it. 
But it's possible to have people who have issues with their brothers and sisters, but all they enjoy is worship great church, but there's no transformation. So the enemy works tirelessly to cause the church not to mature. And in this house, we need to be aware. What weakens us is failure to grow according to the dictates of the word of God. Failure to grow. I mean, let's be honest. January to now, what were you working on? That God has said you should work on. Or were you even aware God was speaking to you to work on certain parts of your life and build a stronger structure? Can I look at your notes and see what you've been busy with? Do you even have a notebook? Because don't think you'll sit here and remember everything. It's not going to be like that. It doesn't work like that. The brain scientists, they tell me brain was, desi- was designed to forget, not to remember. So the job of the brain is it absorbs now. When you get out of there, it had forgotten probably 90% of what God said. If the job of the brain is to help you forget, because otherwise if you remembered everything since you were born, it would be a mess. So the brain has to rub some of the things and we forget what happened when you were seven, eight, nine, ten. You remember one or two things, but the whole lot you don't. That's the job of the brain. So we need, we need notes. We need journals. We are tracking God, isn't it? We're tracking our own development. We're tracking our growth. So if I check from January to now, what are you working on as far as the speaking of God? Can you be able to show it? Can you even define it? Where are you with God? Those are the things the enemy fights. Sometimes the enemy just puts things that are not a priority. We give ourselves to this thing so much simply so that it could take away focus on maturity. Maturity is a platform upon which each saint is increasingly fortified. You see that word? Made strong. It's maturity processes that make Christians strong. It is a maturity process that builds strength in a child of God. And it is maturity that brings us to proper functionality in the house of God or in the call of God. And the Bible says when we function, we grow the church and we edify the body of Christ. That's the call of God over each one of us, to edify the body. Our works must edify the body. Amen? Our works must edify the body. Amen? So whenever we touch a thing of God, please let's be prepared to do it excellently. No half-cooked works. Otherwise, don't do it. If you're not ready to do God's job excellently, don't do it. Are you hearing what I'm saying? But every one of us must be prepared. If I'm going to touch the things of God, I must give my whole self to it. I must try and produce the best for God. That must be the spirit. If we're going to have a meeting, uh, then let's, 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 let's give our whole life to it and make sure it represents God. Maturity is a platform to increase people's strengths and abilities and capacities. So the devil fights, so people never enter this space. 30 years in church, nothing much achieved. People still weak. Just need a little bit of pressure, they are out, they are gone. Offended, or whatever the case might be, no I'm long, longer hear the word. Um, the anointing is no longer in the house. It's all because people did not grow. Someone fresh would come in here and, and then just connect with the speaking of God. Someone who've been here for long because there was no growth. They, get, they struggle with that. So the many text maturity because of some of these things that are here. This is not an exhaustive list, but uh, I thought I should highlight these ones. Everybody must desire to change. Everybody must do what? Desire to change. It builds you up. It builds us up. Everybody must desire to change. And everybody must work for change. Amen? Yeah? Now, because we're dealing with dimensional war, 
There's a context that is within your family. And that context tends to dictate how you look at yourself. Probably I'll talk a little bit more about that, but I just wanted to make that point also clear. There's no growth outside spiritual warfare. It doesn't exist. It's a sword on the right hand, it's food on the left. At the same time, we feed in God, we fight on the right with the right hand. And that's the only way it's done. We ready for this? Amen. Christ became who he is today by maturity. Even him, he had to go through a maturity process to be the Christ that we call him to be today. And he answered them, to you it has been given to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it has not been given. For the one who has more will be what? The one who has more will be given. Now that goes without saying. The one who's not growing, they're losing even what they thought they had. And he will have an abundance. But from the one who has not, even what he has, he has, will be taken away. That's a very scary scripture. These are, these are Christians who sit in church and never track their own personal growth in what God is saying. They may start with this little fire nyana, and three years down the line, they're the coldest person ever because even what they have, the enemy will wipe it out. Wipe it out. So in God, there's nothing like I started at step 10. After five years, I didn't move, but I'm still at step 10. No, there's nothing like that. If you never move from 10 to 11, 12, 13, when you check, you'll be at zero. Your prayer life will be at zero. You have to start afresh to learn how to pray. I used to be an intercessor. So what happened? You never grew in prayer. So prayer is God. You struggle to pray five minutes. But you used to pray three, four hours. But because there was no growth in that area, even that which we had gets taken away. So maturity is a very important issue. Hebrews 5, 7 to 10. During the days of Jesus, Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears. I mean, this is God. Why did he even need to pray this intensely? Fervent cries and tears. I mean, uh, you understand this kind of prayer this was? A fervent cry and tears. It was not a soft prayer. It was hard. With fervent cries and tears to the one who could save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverent submission. Son though he was, he learned obedience. Although he was a son, he learned what? Now this is Christ we're talking about. From what he suffered. He learned obedience from what he suffered. And once made perfect, he became. You see that statement there? Once Christ needed to be perfected by going through suffering, yet choosing God all the time in his suffering. That's the scripture right there. Through suffering, he chose God over and over and over, and he, was, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. Well, you and me always see the output of him going to the cross, but that's not what made him the source of salvation. It was his obedience that came out of pain that actually made him eternal salvation for all who obey him, for all who obey him, for all who obey him, and was designated by God to be high priest in the order of Melchizedek. So because the enemy knows, uh, this place called maturity triggers a whole lot of heavenly, massive resources and authority to the church and to us. He fights it all the time. Teach people uh, things that just encourages them and exhorts them and hype them, but don't teach them how to talk oh, because they'll remain weak. Not in this house. Someone say not in this house. Not in our Congress either. We, we understand this thing. 
Maturity, according to me, it's standing as the standard and pattern of the fullness of Christ. Becoming the weight that has been sent to us. Not proclaiming the weight, but becoming the weight. That should be how we interface with the word. Um, becoming what God preaches is what should drive us. Becoming the word, not proclaiming the word. And that to me, it's maturity. So when God speaks, he targets certain elements in my spirit that needs to be sorted out. Or certain things in my context that needs to be redefined. So I need to pay attention to the Lord. Amen. It's a standard. It's a pattern of the fullness of Christ. That's what maturity is all about. And we need to aspire to go there. It's almost like um, we get to a point where we can tell every element, every piece, every word of the word of God has control over me. Every single one of it. I've gotten to a place where only the word defines how I act, how I behave. That's a position of maturity right there. And you know, in real life, uh, you get tested for such uh, uh, positioning of your life. But that's where, sacrifice, well, that's where uh, through, 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 through suffering, you still keep a position in God. And um, by that we are made. Love is patient, right? But patience is produced through suffering. Patience is produced through suffering. And the painful thing or the most difficult thing about love is patient is that you'll be tested by the people you live with, not external people. The very people in your house that you're supposed to love are the one who will test your patience. For love is patient. But if you can survive that pressure, the Bible says you then become patient yourself. It's no longer a theory to you. It has become life. You are just patience. Patience does not mean you accept everything that comes at all. doesn't mean that. Now let me talk about God is sovereign. What, when I looked at the UDR and went through the word God is sovereign. This is the scripture in the video. For by him all things were created. So we can relax. The, all things were created by God. Who is our dad? Everything is under him. Everything is under control. Amen? The earth and the people who live in it belongs to God. Yeah? The Chinese belong to God. If God needs to touch the Chinese to favor me, they will have a choice. Whether I know how to talk or not, it doesn't make any difference. If God touches them to favor me, they will. They are owned by my father. Now, that mentality is very important for a black man. Everything belongs to God. You don't have to feel inferior. This is family stuff. The earth and the people in it belongs to God. Fine, I can go to any country and they call me a foreigner, not me. That's my dad's land there. That's my dad's land. I can land in Nigeria, I'm not a Nigerian, it makes no difference. That's my God's land there. My dad owns that Nigeria. My dad owns South Africa. My dad owns the whole thing. As a matter of fact, this earth is nothing compared to the entire uh, galaxy Milky Way or Milky Way galaxy, whichever way they call it. Earth is just a small piece. He owns it all. And that should say to me, it's okay. I can walk down here with him. Uh, this is family business. And I can position myself forcefully, not arrogantly, but forcefully, because this is my dad's house. Me and him can have a discussion at that level. I'm home here. I'm in charge here because you are in charge. For by him all things were created that are in heaven, that are on earth. <laughs> That's a strange one, that one. 
Because I hear people are afraid of snakes, but God created the thing. So it must, it must respect me. Me and it, when we meet, it goes this way, and I pass. That thing is owned by God. I won't fear it. And sometimes I walk around here, people, they say they're snakes. Every time I leave my house, I say, I will step on the ground. I said, the owner of the land is coming. If there's a snake on my path, you move. I own this place. I don't really meet them often, even if they are here, because I declare. Now, and I, I walk in, in bushy places inside here. But I own this thing because God owns it. Everything in the earth was created by God. God did not give us a spirit of fear, right? <laughs> but everything is meant to work for the house of God, for the people of God, the children of God. You are Anglo-America, I don't care. You whatever makes the difference. If God wants to touch anybody and make them a Cyrus for me and for the house, he will do it. I respect the hard work they put I respect the experiences they have, but I respect God more. And I don't walk like I'm begging anything. I do understand building relationships in the business world. You be careful how you build relationships. You don't just become arrogant. I do understand that, but behind me, I know the authority of God controls everything. Things that are visible and things that are invisible, whether thrones or dominions or principalities or powers. Now you understand with that line that there's a whole structure in the spirit realm. As we're sitting here, there's a whole structure up there of government and authority. Both those that have fallen with the devil and those that belong to God. All things were created through him and for him. The devil was created for God. He just fell. And we'll look at how did he fall. So we don't fall in the same trap. Or rather we know when he tries to deal with us in the same way he dealt with Adam and Eve. But one other important thing about this scripture, it's this one, Isaiah 45, 7. I am the Lord and there is no other. There is no God besides me. I will gird you though you have not known me that they may know from the rising of the sun to its setting that there is none besides me. I am the Lord and there is no other. I form the light and I create darkness. I make peace, but I also create commotion, calamity. I, the Lord, do all these things. And that's one of the scriptures that will take theology out of our minds. God is good all the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Even when he creates darkness, he's being good. Amen. He's God. Not human. He's God. And the biggest thing about this thing is that uh, God created all things and he is the only one who defines it all as it's supposed to be. What is light to us may be darkness to him. And what we call darkness actually might be light to God. So we'll be too careful to think this is darkness and uh, when our brain is too small, you can interact with God. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. Okay, let me go back. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for what? She saw by her perception the tree was good for food. And she says, and it says it was pleasant to the eyes. Which eyes? The natural eye. And a tree desirable to make one wise. That's the temptation part today. She stole that line not from herself. God never said this tree is desirable to make one wise. <laughs> Something else said to her, look at it carefully. That thing is desirable to make you wise. And then she used those words as though they were hers. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and the tree desirable to make one wise, she took off its fruit and ate. She also gave to the husband who was there with her, and he also ate. Then the Lord God called to Adam, verse 9, and said to him, Where are you? So he said, I heard your voice in the garden, and I was afraid because I was naked. 
and I hid myself. Now here's a powerful statement. God says, who told you that you are naked? Who now all of a sudden defines what is naked? I never told you there's something called naked. Where did you get that definer? Who told you? Who told you that is good, that is bad? Who defined that for us? What's good and what's not good? The context upon which we live has a big influence on how we look at life. Hence I say some things that we might think they are light, they are actually darkness in the eyes of God. We need revelation to actually see them. And things that we think they are so dark, it cannot be God. We find that God is the author of the whole thing. We just don't see what actually is trying to do. I'm told in spiritual warfare, uh, when there are clashes of powers, God has finally defeated the princes of a geographical area. For them to leave the area, they cause catastrophe of natural disasters. Either tsunamis, earthquakes, because there was war in the spirit and they were defeated. You remember Jesus prayed for somebody uh, who had demons and the demons uh, threw the person down. They were trying to, before we leave, deal with this person. So what we might think is darkness without the sight of God, uh, we may not realize in it there's light. So that's why he says, I create light and I also create what you may think is darkness. Amen? But we need to be careful who is defining us. Who told you? Who's defining us? What defines us? Where do we take our definition that we live by today? I don't like this. I like that. Where do you get that from? Did you get it from God? I don't prefer this. I prefer that. Who told you? How you live your life. I don't like this. I don't like that. Who told you? Amen. The Jewish law taught Peter that there is uh, unholy food and holy food. The Jewish law. Not God. And God came to him and said, never call anything unclean when I say to you it's clean. Just because of your Jewish law, they told you that animal is unclean. I created the animal. I'm saying to Peter, eat it. Peter says, well, this is unclean. He says, you shall never call something unclean which I called clean. That's God. What's defining us as we're sitting here? What context defines the way we are? Our mannerism, our preferences, our senses of dislikes and likes. Things we go to, things we run away from. What, what defined us? And if we're children of God, we need to make sure we are not defined by any context but the word of God. Did you hear what I just said? Because that's a major deliverance for some of us. Finally let go your worldly perception and perspective of who you really are and therefore what you like and what you don't like. What God likes, we like. Come on. And it's in the word. What God does not like, we don't like. Or let's put it straight. What God hates, we hate. It's in the word. Not our context. Not some book we read somewhere about psychology and this and this and this and that. No, but what God says. The flesh will never submit to the word of God. It is meant to submit by force. But generally the flesh will never submit to the things of God. It operates by a different law, Paul says. Okay, I want to unmask self here. What we call self-actualization uh, well, all of it is it's a, it's a self-concept. The concept of self. Self-determination, self-confidence, self-this, self-this, self-this that's going on around the world today. And it looks like it's a godly statement. It comes from the pit of hell. Isaiah 14, 12 to 14. These scriptures are in the UDR, Amen. How you are fallen from heaven, O Lucifer. Okay, we know he started by being Lucifer and now later is called Satan or Satan. How, have, how are you fallen from heaven, O Lucifer? That was his name. Son of the morning. How you are cut down to the ground. 
You who weakened the nations. He does that even today. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will also sit on the mount of the congregation on the farther sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Who came up with I? The devil himself. He's, he's, the, he's the originator of the word I. Self-concept. Self-determination. It comes from him. And that's what caused him to lose his position in God. This self. I will do this. I, 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 I. That's what caused him to lose his place in God. Lucifer was beautiful and perfect in all his ways from creation, the Bible says. His fall is attributed to, be, to beginning in self and not beginning in God's definition of himself. He took his own definition and rejected God's definition. In the same way, he enticed Sarah to use the frequency of Satan or earth or the world and the principles of a time-based world to walk inside the passages of a spiritual real, realm. Uh, and that caused death. In his life. So the devil operated from himself, not from what God says he was, he was. And that's how he tempted Adam and Eve. He taught them the same thing. To say, look at this thing from your own perspective. Don't hear what God said. That if you eat that tree, you'll die. He says, but look at it carefully. This thing is desirable to eat. Who brought the self to Eve? It was not Eve thinking. It was a devil planting it. I'm convinced till today, whatever we call self has its roots from the devil. He's the father of self. He's a father of self-concept. We think we are thinking, but we're not. We're implementing his thoughts. To determine your own path. Be happy all by yourself. Every self, every self, every self. It's not our brain that is thinking it. It's a context that taught us. And that context, Ephesians chapter 2, is governed by the devil. So everything that people call self, by the way, they are just implementing the devil's agenda. That's it. The self never originated from men. Before Satan entered, Adam and Eve had no opinion except that which came from God. They had no opinion. They were not running around trying to have personal opinions. They knew God said, this is it, this is that, this is that. That's how they lived. Until the devil came. What is considered self-concept is actually Satan's mind planted in a human being's brain. And all of it is about rebelling against who we really are in God and therefore causing us a whole lot of trouble and failure to walk with God. Before the fall, the power or authority to define true reality what is good or bad, right or wrong, actually belonged to God in the lives of Adam and Eve. They needed to hear from him define a thing, and they walked by it. Self-concept have their origin and mastery in Satan himself. We know God himself says, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, says the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. God is bigger than we can imagine. You know, you try to study astronomy to understand the vastness of uh, God's creation. And then they talk about how planets are positioned in the galaxy, in the Milky Way galaxy. They talk about how much time, well, not really time, but the length it will take, the, these planets are from each other. And they tried to measure. I don't know how they did it. By the way, with all that science, it's what they could define. There's a whole lot more that they can't. And they can't even see. They themselves acknowledge there's at least so many stars out there, but we don't know. Because that's what we could access and see. I don't even know how they numbered them. Maybe they used some statistical method. He just put a square in the Milky Way galaxy and counted those ones based on what they could see. 
What they could not see was missed in the counting. But that's how vast uh, God is. The thoughts of God about us are way beyond what we think about ourselves. Now think carefully. Who we really think we are compared to who God thinks we are, it's worlds apart. We must be careful not to be too confident to define ourselves. We don't even know ourselves. Only God does. Only him can help us understand who we are. We don't know ourselves. This brain is trying to kill us. Honestly, as DNW would say, he's trying to define us in ways that are too low to the way God will define us, according to this scripture. What is ministry? What is church? It's bigger than what we think. Me standing here, it's bigger than me just making sound here. This thing is bigger. And I have to be here with great respect if that be the case. Everything in our lives must resolve themselves in God. That statement. Everything in our lives must resolve themselves in God. Anything that cannot confluence to God. What's another word of confluence, Kanan? Converge. Thank you. That's the one I'm looking for. Everything must converge to God. He's the one who defines everything I will train myself to live by and to prefer in my life. So we need to stand in great respect of his position to define and therefore direct our lives. Very, very careful about how we stand before God. We allow him to define us. And then we teach ourselves to follow what he just said. Okay, let's rush. Okay, critical position of leadership or headship, even in the house. Satan rose up against Israel. It could be Satan rising up against a family. So he incites the head of the family. And part of inciting the head of the family is refusing the head to be head. Yeah, I won't talk about that for now. Satan rose up against KCA and he incited me to do something that God hates. And KCA will be in trouble. I pray the Lord will help me and the leadership here to understand. And we know the Bible says, Then David said to God, I have sinned greatly by doing this. Now I beg you, take away the guilt of your servant. I have done a very foolish thing because 70,000 men died because of David's action. 70,000. Innocent. Not him. The people he was leading, they died because of his decision. Because of his decision. Then the Lord said to God, David, see our prophet. Go and tell David. This is what the Lord says. In other words, God was not even talking to David. I don't want to talk to him. I'll talk through his prophet. You go tell him. I am giving him three options. Choose one of them for me to carry out against you. David said to God, I am in deep distress. Let me fall into the hands of the Lord. For his mercy is very great. But do not let me fall into human hands. Verse 18, then the angel of the Lord ordered God, the prophet or the seer, to tell David again to go up and build an altar for the Lord on the threshing floor of Arauna, the Jebusite. So David went up in obedience to the word that God had spoken in the name of the Lord. But, the, but, but King David replied to Arauna when Arauna offered the land to build the altar for free. David replied to him and said, No, I insist on paying the full price. I will not take for the Lord what is yours or sacrifice a bent offering that caused me nothing. Quick things on that. Satan knew the mysterious connection between the internal condition of a leader and the destiny of the people. We need to be careful of that. As heads in our family, we are a doorway. Whatever we permit will live in our houses. Uh, whatever we don't permit should not stand in that house. So if we are heads of families, let's be aware of that position. Uh, First Chronicles, Satan rose up against Israel and he incited the leader. We read that. To restore the community, David was ordered to build an altar to the Lord. Here we also see a principle of surrounding the altar with sacrifice paying the price for it. Because David says, I would not offer to the Lord something that didn't cost me anything. This is a call to take our headship or leadership responsibility for the restoration and growth of our households or KCA by raising an altar unto the Lord 
the place of sacrifice and paying the, the price. It's almost like we are saying every head of the family, if they did not have an altar, it's about, to, we, it's, it's about time that we start okay, having intercessions alone as heads over our families in a different way. Build a prayerful life in that, in that house as a head. Rearrange your life. Uh, it mustn't be said the wives are more prayerful, we are not. It's about time the head be the one who's ten times more prayerful uh, than the wife. So we need to have uh, altars and we need to action this word. We find a way how Hebronites uh, start to take this word seriously. But that's what God said to David. If you want to fix it, build an altar. You know, go before God and present our hearts to him. Heads and leaders redevelop the fear to clean out all inappropriate actions towards God in themselves so that uh, the family can be saved. Revisiting the core values of light that must form the basis of our unbreakable standards of righteousness to lead our family by. And I think in doing that, I want us to look at dimensional war, personal battle. Blessed is the man who endures temptation. James 1, 12 to 15 says, when, we, when he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am tempted by God, for God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he himself tempt anyone. But each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires and enticed by the devil in the same way, own desires. Then when desires has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, it brings forth death. I think I mentioned a statement somewhere. Certain, certain uh, test us by seduction, by seducing everyone. So certain will test by seducing everyone of us quality or integrity of our internal structure. He will also test our structural responsiveness to the released word of God over our lives, to derail us, to delay, and to stop the development and growth of our faith. Every single one of us will be tested by the devil. Every one of us. We're sitting here, the devil already is after your character. He's after your God-called position, either in the house or in the house of God, or in the community or in your work, wherever you are. Everyone will be tested to check the quality of our character, what we call internal integrity. Amen? Everyone will be tested to obey the word of God. Structural responsiveness to the speaking of God. But the Bible says here, uh, each one is tempted when he is drawn away by his own desires uh, and is enticed. Let's look at uh, how the enemy operates uh, we know the three phases in a human being or three structures in a human being. The outer body, which is our physical body, right? We know that. And then we know we have a soul. Uh, and then we know we have a spirit. Now these two, spirit and soul, or heart and brain, when the Lord speaks of a heart, he speaks of our, 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 our spiritual brain. Let me put it that way. Is the spirit us. Is the us in the spirit when God speaks of the heart. You know, it is then the heart that receives the word. Then when the word has reached my spirit, it needs to be transferred to my brain. Because my brain controls what happens to my body. The heart receives the word, but the brain dictates to the body and therefore creates our environment outside. The word of God comes to our inner person, our spirit. CV is core value. Yeah? So core values are built in the heart of a man. If anything happens and you respond without thinking, it's from your core value. You have already built it that way. If you are challenged in one thing or another, you, re you react without even thinking. It's already been marked and built inside you. It's a core value. Amen? So when the word of God speaks, it targets that area of our lives. So God works from inside out, from the heart, so that the heart, what is received, it will tell the brain, this is how we live. And then the brain will tell my body, this is how you should feel. And this is where you should go. 
coming from the heart. But the devil also knows. He operates from outside in. He does things that attracts the body so that the body can tell the brain to do them. And when the brain does it more, it becomes internal. It becomes a core value. So every time you look at the bottle of wine, you are in trouble. It didn't come from inside. It came from outside. The devil advertised the bottle so much, so much, so much until the brain decided to test the thing. And the brain has tested and now it's so much of a dominance in your spirit. It's so much in the heart now. You do it without thinking. It becomes a struggle to come out of it. Now this devil knows that's how a human being has been built. So he knows if I want to cause this person to do things that are dark, let me attract him because he can only operate from outside, not from inside. But the more the brain accepts those decisions over and over and over, before you know it, they sit in the wrong place. You are already addicted to those things. Now, we need to be able to allow the word of God to come into the heart so that we tell the brain how to think, how to look at things, redefine how we look at things and how we look at ourselves by the word of God. We redefine ourselves. Is everyone hearing me? Because this is where the battle is. This is where the battle is. Our struggles, simply because we were not careful what we allowed to come into the core of our hearts. We have allowed certain things to come deep into our hearts. Cultures and traditions and religion and all kinds of stuff the devil brought to us, they end up sitting in the wrong place. Pornography and all these things, the devil brought them from outside, they are now sitting deep inside. Becomes very difficult for people to come out of it. You know, rebellion against God, unfaithfulness, you name it. It came from outside, was practiced over and over, now it sits at the core. It now tells the brain. Every time you see that, the brain wants to act. It's been trained in it. But thank God it can be reversed by the word of God. When God says this tree, if you eat this tree, it will kill you, we tell the brain, that's death. We don't speak like Sarah. It looks pleasant for food. No, God said it will kill you. The devil says, but it looks pleasant for food. And the word says, no, it will kill you. So we allow the word to train the brain what God said, not what the world says. The world may say one thing, but what did God say about this thing I'm looking at? This thing is here to kill me. It's death. And if it's death, it's death. Until the brain gets it. But when we look into that thing, we say death. We don't say pleasant for food. It's the core that needs to be trained. Somebody struggles with sin, right? And then says, I've been praying and I've been praying and I've been praying. It's not going. Because of that, you reintroduce these things deliberately without prayer. It will go out the same way. Redefine the thing by the word of God in your heart and clean out your heart. Retrain your brain that no, no, actually that thing was death. I refuse. You'll pray until you get tired. You'll still go to the same problem and you fall. The only thing you need to do is change that internal structure. The same way you went in, that's the same way you'll come out. The word was planted in your heart. And you accepted it. Now reject the word. Over and over. And see death for what it is. Because the enemy only comes to steal, kill and destroy. I tell you now. You live for many years. And never become who you are. Because you are trapped by guilt. You try to move forward. But you feel guilty. And that's what the devil wanted anyway. So life passes you by. You are like a drunkard man. An alcoholic. Who won't even remember what date is today? He's been drunk for three months, doesn't even tell, doesn't even know. Life passed them. So sin and guilt, that's what it does. It makes people lose time unaware in wrong things. When you could have advanced in your life, you're still trapped by these things that you allowed to come into the heart. So this is our dimensional war. We need to make sure 
we clean up our heart by what God says. Some of us, our hearts are full of wrong definitions of ourselves because we got it from home. I'm the least of my family. My family is a nobody. Now it's in here. So you handle yourself as a nobody. You can't even see opportunities because you feel that's not for me. That's not for me. And, and opportunities just passes us by because of wrong definitions of who we are sitting in the core of our hearts. We need to take God's definition of ourselves and stand up straight and strong. If this is who God says I am, I subscribe to that. Teach your brain what God says you are. Teach your brain over and over and over and over and over and then you are fortified and you are strong. Everybody has to fight this battle. Everyone. Everyone. It's nothing like I'm born short-tempered. No. Everybody who comes to Christ must change. That's what salvation is all about. Everybody change. Well, I'm not assertive. It needs to change. You go to war. You're going to do battle. You cannot always sit and defend yourself from the devil. You must go to his camp. And go fight. Now people are always too nice and too quiet. I was born this way. You've got to change that. You're too nice to the devil. You're too accommodative to the devil and he likes it. You are so nice even to him. So you're not moving. You're not charging forward. You're not going to get things and get things done. You always take a step back. When you're supposed to be an A team, you always push yourself back to a B team. And that's not who you are. You're supposed to be in there and rumble and wrestle. And if you're in this house, maybe you should be like me. Maybe become a son like me. We get our hands dirty. We fight. I, I, I hate lack of progress. I hate it with my whole life. I really do. My wife will tell you. I push things aside, something has to happen. Otherwise, I'll grow old. Like some of the people I see, they have nothing to show for their faith in God. Being up here is very easy for me. To be here, me, you can call me without preparing, I stand there, I preach. This is my comfort zone. But if I sit here, all the time. I grow old with nothing but speaking all the time. I refuse. The call of God is dynamic. It's got different con co components to it. The different elements to this thing. And I need to push myself there. So everybody has to do what? Change. Don't accept to be the same person over and over even in God we change. We grow higher and higher from glory to glory. It says, why are you still like last year? It can't be. Are you with me? You must fight for yourself, by the way. Refuse for the context to define you. Be defined by the word. Take out this context that's in your heart that has defined you up to today. Such that you have preferences that are contrary to the word of God. You know what I'm talking about, right? Must I bring it down to where you are? You won't be offended? Because I can. Just take who God says you are. Live by it. Stop taking what the world tells you. Because the world belongs to the devil according to Ephesians chapter 2. Don't go according to the definers of the world. I don't, call, I don't care what they call it. Psychology, ecology, ecology, ecology makes no difference. If the word says this is who you are, that's final authority. Not psychology, but the word. We're not going to change the house of God into a psychological platform. We leave word here. Jesus defeated the enemy simply because he started in God. He didn't start in the world. Even when the devil tried to, you know, to trick him by scriptures, he started in God. This is what God said. I will not take what you take. You cannot even preach to me as the world. But today we have Christians who are preached to by the worldly people. Especially because they are celebrities. There will be no celebrity who is not saved up here. 
in my church as long as I live. Not going to happen. Well, maybe if we do business, but not preach the word. Don't preach the word. Because then we're allowing the devil to preach to us. And then these celebrities make some cliches here that sounds almost biblical. And the church runs with it and anger God. Because we allow the devil to come and preach because this person is always on TV too much. To be on TV too much, you don't need to be a good man. As a matter of fact, you need to be a bad person to be on TV. A lot. I mean social media. People know good news is not news. News is bad news. That's what people want to see. Amen. You post anything about your outreach or preaching Christ, you won't have a lot of following. But put something that is dark. You'll see. Everybody has to do what? Change. And the place we need to change is our hearts, not the brain. The brain will always want to interpret things the way we trained it. We must retrain it by the word of God. Someone say yes to that. So the UDR is coming here to try and help us do better. Serious deliverance has to happen. Serious deliverance has to happen. Can't be defined by culture or tradition or family or anything, but by the word of God. We say yes to that. God created them what? Male and? That's it. I'm male and accept it. I don't know why he wanted me to be male, but I'm happy in it. Fulfills his will. Everybody should be happy in who God chose you to be. You say yes to that? Okay, I said then mind and heart transfer. Uh, what I'm talking about is a mind and heart transfer. So difference between download and in installation. So the way it comes, it's a download. Installation takes process. Download can happen quickly, but installation takes a lot of effort that we must give ourselves to. What I'm saying, it's a download. What I'm doing now, it's a download. Implementation, you have to fight with yourself. It's going to be hard to accept who God says you are. That's installation. Installation, you have to fight with your own core values that are outside the will of God and change them. You have to change them. Now, these are the things you grew up with and who did, that defined you. Now you must go back home and change them. Amen. All right. The Holy Ghost will help us. Okay, I already spoken to that. Uh, I just mentioned the rich young ruler was too invested in earthly definitions of wealth. He could not see that Christ was not taking away his position. Actually, he was going to unlock him even the more. What is the context surrounding the definitions of our identity? God reveals that the key uh, to our transformation requires our minds to be set on things that come from him. For the earth and the heavens are two authorities vying for influence. And we know Philippians speaks to that. Uh, we need to, to master what we call newness technology like David. David was able to, even if he had walked with God in the previous season a particular way, but when he enters a new season, he asks God, how should I live in this season? He didn't use yesterday's experiences. Paul speaks about it. He says, whatever I have achieved in the past, I keep pushing myself forward. Uh, so there must always be a renewal in our lives. We must be careful to stay in the same places and never allow ourselves to move to the next thing. Yes, God has taken us through a beautiful phase, but we must be like uh, Paul here. Learn to push ourselves to higher things. We are all children of God, called by God to have progress and move forward and grow and be functional in the call of God and um, make him proud. Amen. Let's fight the battle. Let's take responsibility to fight the battle. Let's accept maturity is for us, for our empowerment. And let's chase after it. Let's know what we are dealing with. What are we working on? What are the parts of me that still don't line up with the word of God? That I need to then search scriptures to help me redefine myself. 
What are issues of low self-esteem I'm dealing with? What are the issues of too much confidence in what I can do more than what God wants me to walk in? What are these things that surround my definition? What are these voices that are trying to make noise? Children are a gift from God. No one can produce a child but God. God gives it. And usually God will give a child to defy even the context of their birth. So they know there is a God in heaven. Allow you to be born in a very complex context so that you can show off even to the devil. But don't let that environment define you. You're defined by God. You are fearful and wonderfully made. Simple as that. And the devil times come to whisper to you, said you have not read the Bible well. Fearfully and wonderfully made. I'm created in the image of my father. What are the things that surrounds how we define our lives such that we have this mannerism that's ungodly? We need to challenge everything. We've received the download. Now we go for installation. Clean up house. Clean up our hearts. Clean up the environment that's trying to define us. May we walk with God in a real way. Direct interfacing with God, it's a beautiful thing. Beautiful. But hard work to get there. And everyone must say, I push myself to that place. To that place. So Father, we are grateful for your word. We ask you to continue to give us grace in this house. That we be able to implement your speaking. And be transformed by it. To you be honor and glory. In Jesus name. Amen and amen. Bless you.